The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. The No Child Left Behind Act of 2001, passed by Congress with overwhelming bipartisan approval, has as its goal that every American child be proficient in math and reading by 2014. Many believe that the law's emphasis on state-based testing standards, alongside penalties for failing schools, would encourage public schools to improve student achievement. Meanwhile, some education reformers advocated for more charter schools and school vouchers that would allow parents to choose better schools for their children. In the years that followed, however, many have been disappointed in the results of these educational reforms. Joining us is one such critic, Diane Ravitch, who was Assistant Secretary of Education under President George H.W. Bush and is the author of The Death and Life of the Great American School System, How Testing and Choice Are Undermining Education. And now the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherard. Diane Ravitch, welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. It's wonderful to be with you, Doug. It really is. Uh, and you know, we're here partly because of your new book, The Death and Life of the Great American School System. Uh, it has garnered a great deal of attention, and I think, um, uh, I think many people will read it and learn uh, so much about what's happening today. Uh, but I'd like to start by asking you, what is the great American school system? Public education. And, and the, the story that I tell is about uh, the reforms. It's particularly the story of the re reforms right now of, uh, and the reforms of the past 10 or 15 years uh, that I think are endangering, endangering public education. And I am not happy with the status quo. I think we need to have dramatic improvement. We need to have a quantum leap in the, the learning and the knowledge of our children. Uh, but what the book says is that the path we're on is the wrong, the wrong track, that we have uh, embarked on a program over the past 10 years or so of accountability, punitive accountability, um, and also choice uh, of, of a kind that is undermining our public schools and that we're headed on a path to destroying public education in America, to put, not to put too fine a point on it. And I would like to make an argument that public education is very important for our democracy, for our society, for you know, mobility, and that we shouldn't allow it to be pulled apart by all the forces that are now pulling it apart. Now that was quite a list, and let's try to go through it one by one. I take it that one of, from reading your book, one of the main culprits is the No Child Left Behind law and how it's been implemented. Uh, before telling us what you think is wrong about the law, maybe you could synopsize what it tries to do because from a distance it seems as if it has a wonderful purpose which is to leave no child left behind, to, to, to look to the least successful students and try to bring them up uh, to, I guess, their more affluent peers. Well, the idea behind No Child Left Behind was a very beneficent idea, and, and it's why uh, when it was first proposed by uh, President George W. Bush, it was his initial piece of legislation, his signature legislation, uh, he got tremendous bipartisan support. Uh, the, the No Child Left Behind attracted the support of almost 90 percent of both Democrats and Republicans, and its champions in Congress were uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, Congressman George Miller, uh, and their counterparts on the Republican side. So uh, I think that everybody looked to this law thinking, aha, this is how we're going to raise up the lowest performing students uh, and maybe help some of the higher performing ones as well. So like so many reforms in American education, things haven't worked out as they were intended. If they had, we would not be where we are today. So the law has a combination of goals, tests, penalties. I'm not sure if there are incentives built in, the incentives if they are negative. But could you tell us about the goals in the law and how they try to accomplish them? Well, what, what the law says in brief is uh, every child from grades three through eight will be tested once a year in reading and math. And uh, by the year 2014, 100% of America's children will be proficient 
in, uh, in reading and math. 2014, so that but was... It's real close, right? It's coming up. But, so that was in 12 years from the time the law was signed. 100% would be proficient. Now the How law... How did they choose 12 years from then? Well, assuming that children who start school, you know, in 2002, by 2014, everyone will be proficient. Now, the law also requires that schools disaggregate the reporting. In other words, they report students by race, uh, by uh, ethnicity, uh, by low-income status, by disability, and uh, a couple of other categories. But they divide up these different categories. And so you have to have 100% of blacks, 100% of Hispanics, 100% of low-income, 100% of children in special education proficient by the year 2014. Now, at the time the law was passed, everybody thought, what a wonderful goal. The problem is that the, the law also has very specific sanctions and penalties. And it says if every state has to say, this is our timetable for reaching 100% proficiency. So if the schools start to fall behind and there's some group that's not making adequate yearly progress, then the school goes onto the failing list. Uh, last year, 35% of the public schools in the United States were considered to be failing schools. 35. 35%. That's about maybe 30,000 or so schools were considered failing schools. It's a very large number because many schools that were really doing a great job would have one group. Let's say the children with disabilities were not making the progress they thought necessary. So the whole school is then stigmatized as a failing school. Now these are not federal tests. These are No, every state has its own test. And so every state can say, what does proficiency mean? Well, it turns out that proficiency in Texas is different from proficiency in Illinois or in New York or in Maine. Every state has its own definition of proficiency. Every state has its own testing program. So as time has gone by, more and more schools are failing. Uh, there, a group of social scientists in California has predicted that by the year 2014, every elementary school, or almost every elementary school in the state of California, would be a failing school. Now, the law also prescribes specific penalties. Uh, not penal yeah, the penalties or the remedies. If a school fails for X numbers of years, I think it's five or six years in a row, it can become turned into a charter school, it can be privatized, it can be closed, it can be taken over by the state, the entire staff can be fired, there are draconian penalties. Now, what makes all of this bizarre is the draconian penalties are real for a goal that is totally out of reach. If you look at the state reports, the states say, oh, 80 to 90 percent of our kids are now proficient. But on the federal test, it's more like 25 to 30 percent. So the so states have watered down the, their The tests. states have watered down their standards. Far from raising standards, the states have watered down their standards. And uh, they're doing this to avoid these draconian penalties. And in the meanwhile, it's only about reading and math. Uh, there's no incentive to teach history, literature, geography, civics, uh, science. All of these things have no incentive attached to them. The only incentive, because the penalties are there, are for reading and math. So I think most people would say, and if, I think if you ask any teacher, they would say, we teach reading and math, and we only do test prep. Until the state test is finished, we're doing test prep and test prep and test prep. That, so that's where we are with No Child Left Behind. We don't have school-age children anymore, although we're about to have school-age grandchildren. Uh, but I take it these tests are um, uh, strikingly important in schools. We have a local school here, and the mother of a very bright child told me that she called to say her son was sick and wasn't coming in the day of one of these tests. And the principal called and said, couldn't he come in? The principal offered to come pick him up and drive him to school so they that he needed could be him. in the, they needed him in the test. Well, see, the, there's a dis basically the schools don't really worry about the brightest kids because they've already crossed the bar of proficiency. And they, they almost don't worry about the kids at the very bottom because they're so far below proficiency. Mm -hmm. They focus on the kids in the middle that they can push up the bar. They're called the bubble kids to get them over that lever. I mean, basically, what No Child Left Behind has created is a culture of testing in which knowledge is unimportant because knowledge doesn't count. And the only thing that matters is scores on the standardized multiple choice dumbed down test. And uh, I, I've never met a teacher who said things are better because of this testing regime. How did all this happen? Uh, and how did all the support get garnered for an approach which, in hindsight, we have to scratch our heads and say, what did they have in mind? I think it's probably the law of unintended consequences. I think that if we were to look back and say, did anyone realize this was going to be the outcome? Did, did George W. Bush and the Republicans realize that this was going to represent the most 
dramatic expansion of federal intrusion into the classrooms of America ever in history, I think they would have said, oh, no, we're leaving every state to define its own, pick its test and define proficiency. That was until 2009. Right. right? We'll get to that in a moment. Yes. So I, th I don't think that uh, the Republicans understood how extensive the federal role would become and, and how intrusive it would become. And I think the Democrats expected, well, you know, it's great. We have a vastly expanded federal role. We like that. And that means lots more money will follow. Well, some more money did follow. There was a big increase in the education budget. But um, I think to this day, the leading Democrats in Congress will defend No Child Left Behind because they say, well, at least it gives us accountability. But by accountability, what they mean is that someone somewhere is being punished. And what has been created, which nobody's really thus far been willing to take the blame for, is an incredibly punitive atmosphere towards teachers, an incredibly punitive atmosphere towards schools. And it's not constructive. Just punishing people doesn't make schools better. Well, it's quite striking. I interrupted you a moment ago, but uh, because I wanted to get to the really massive change that's being forced on the states by the Obama administration with the um, stimulus money. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, th there, there's a principle that you're well aware of called federalism, in which the federal government has a relatively minor role in education because it doesn't put up very much money. The federal contribution to the cost of education is, is about eight cents on the dollar. And the states pay the biggest chunk, and usually the states is or where educational authority resides. So between states and local districts, we have uh, lodged both the paying for education and control of education. But the Obama administration has, uh, with the stimulus money that they received uh, of the massive stimulus that passed a year or so ago, they had $100 billion for education. $95 billion was set aside to basically to just keep the schools open and pay teachers and, and keep uh, keep them employed. But for only for one year. so that Right, but only for one year. That will run out and everybody's going to soon be facing a huge financial crunch. But five billion dollars out of the hundred billion was set aside to create a competition. and It was called Race to the Top. I have a little bit of problem with the concept of a race to the top because um, our fundamental principle for many years has been equal educational opportunity. And we're not trying to find someone somewhere who can race to the top. But their race to the top consists of setting certain criteria. One is they want the states to remove limitations on charter schools. And char charter schools are privately managed schools that receive public funds. It's a form of privatization. So you have the Obama administration and congressly suggesting that more public schools should be privatized and put into private entrepreneurs' hands. Uh, second, and either bribing or blackmailing the state. And saying to the states, if you want to have part of this $5 billion pot at a time when you are struggling to, uh, with your deficits, remove any restrictions or, or lift the caps, make them um, increase the number of privatized schools. The second thing they are expecting of the states is that they will use the test scores of students to evaluate the performance of teachers. Now, there are many, many reasons why I can tell you this is a bad idea. Uh, but I have a chapter in, in my book explaining why this doesn't work and why there is no, there's no district. They're not, they're not saying there's a district that we know of that got good success by doing this. If you evaluate teachers based on student test scores, and, and the tests we have right now are, are really not good tests, what you're really saying to the teachers is test prep, test prep, test prep. As bad as the Bush NCLB was in terms of turning the screws with test prep and testing, the Obama administration is raising the stakes by saying not only will you be judged uh, by your student test scores, you might get bonuses, you might get, and you might get fired. If your scores don't go up, you'll be fired. Well, this is this pay for performance business for teachers and so forth. What struck me was, and that was on the table and, and so forth, but what struck me is they didn't impose any accountability at higher levels. This is just the teachers who are to blame when Johnny doesn't do his homework. Well, it's, um, you know, if you, if, if you look generally at why do students do well in school and why do students fail, some part of it is they had a good teacher, they didn't have a good teacher. But what about the student themselves? There used to be a time where we would say if the student didn't come to school, if the student didn't do his homework, 
and, and didn't do well and didn't get a good test score, he has something to do with this, she has something to do with this. So the student is responsible, the family is responsible, and if you ask any parent, they'll say what parents do really matters. If you uh, have a place for your child to do homework, if you make sure they do their homework, that makes a difference. If you talk to them over the dinner table, take them, make sure they go to the library or take them to the museums, that makes a difference. If you neglect all of that and let your kids watch TV or, or play with video games, as long as they want to, that matters too. So parents play a role, students play a role, the community plays a role, the popular culture certainly plays a, plays a role, and yet the only ones who will have their heads on the chopping block will be teachers. Well, this um, is what's striking to me. What I don't, it almost seems like a fad. I thought ten years ago the answer was better principals, and it seems to have shifted from better principals to uh, better teachers. Well, there's, there's this weird uh, thing that's happened. We have a number of economists who studied the schools, you know, from a distance as economists do, and they said the key to everything is the teacher. Now, we know that teachers are really, really important. If you have a bad teacher, it's hard to learn very much, right? So we all want great teachers in the classroom. Then they turn around upside down and say, and if students don't learn, it's because they didn't have a great teacher. So therefore, the success is the teacher's credit, and the failure is the teacher's blame. Everything is on the teacher. But then you, the problem becomes, how do you judge who's a great teacher? Because I'll say, if you have three teachers in a row, great teachers in a row, or five great teachers in a row, you can completely close the achievement gap, and there will be no, no child left behind. Except that no one knows how to identify the great teachers except by looking at test scores. And it turns out that there aren't very many teachers who produce great test scores year after year after year, and there are not enough of them. And so the answer is, well, just fire the bottom 5%. So this year we'll fire the bottom 5%. Next year we'll, at some point, we'll have no teachers left, and nobody will even want to be a teacher. It's well, a ridiculous I a teacher, strategy. I, just to amend your comment for a second, maybe we'll have no teachers left, or maybe we'll have no teachers left in places where children are hard to serve. Right. That's the real danger, is that teachers will migrate to the affluent suburbs, and, and there'll be a competition for jobs there, and they will have the best teachers and the teachers who are left over will, if they want to work, will go to the, to, to the schools with the neediest kids. And that's a terrible outcome. Now, nature abhors a vacuum. And here in the Washington, D.C. area, it's really quite interesting. Maryland has been extremely hostile, the state of Maryland, to charter schools. And I don't even know whether we have one or two, but I don't think we have many. Uh, but I think in D.C., 30 or more percent of the children in the school system now are in charter schools. And that, it seems to me, is uh, the obverse of what you're talking about. And you, you mentioned it when we started this conversation about privatization. Tell us about charter schools. Well, the, the original reason for charter schools, uh, they were created, the idea at least was launched in 1988, and it came from Albert Shanker and some very- A great man. A, a great, great man. man, and a very obscure professor of educational administration in Massachusetts. They didn't know each other, but they both simultaneously come up, came up with the idea that public school teachers would create something like a school within a school. It would be free of all of the bureaucratic regulations, and then they would be free to solve problems uh, they would take the most difficult children, they would take the kids who were unmotivated and didn't want to be in school, and they would come up with new ideas which would then feed back into the regular school so that the regular schools now, you could, call those could become R and D better. laboratories. Right. They're like R and D laboratories within the system. And that's what's so striking to me about the No Child Left Behind law. It doesn't seem to say, you know, we're not really sure how to do this. Let's get a lot of learning under our belts. It seems to assume that the answers are sitting there if only people would do their jobs. Have I got that right? Well, I think a lot of the punitive part of both the No Child Left Behind and also the Obama race to the, race to the top is built on the idea that the way to improve our school is to create incentives and sanctions. The teachers are fundamentally lazy. They're not doing their best. And if you can offer rewards or if you can take sticks and threaten them, threaten to close their schools, threaten to fire them, then they'll do a better job of teaching. This, to me, is very fundamentally wrong because I know lots of teachers and I've spent lots of time in schools, and my impression is that with very few exceptions, teachers are working as hard as they possibly can. You could offer them anything. You could offer them a donut or a th $1,000. They don't know how to do better than what they're doing now. They're not in there saying, I'm only going to give 65% and with a little more money, I'll give 80 they're, Every day is the 100%, and that may be all they have to offer but they're not going to do a better job. They, they may spend more time prepping kids for the test because that's what their job hinges on. 
but they're, they're really working very hard. There, there's, I think, with this punitive approach to teaching has come a lot of rhetoric about, well, we're not getting good people into teaching, the teachers are lousy, we used to have great teachers in the old days, and I can't tell you how many times I have met totally brilliant, hardworking, dedicated people in the classroom, and they're there every day teaching under the most difficult circumstances and getting, at this point in time, no support, uh, no esteem, uh, only disrespect, and being uh, kind of given the stigma of, you're a teacher, oh, too bad, couldn't you have done anything better with your life? That's so terrible because, frankly, I'm in awe. You know, I, I, it bothers me. I've, I've spent lots of time hanging around think tanks and, you know, conference mm -hmm. tables. And I remember one session I went to where there were a lot of governors and CEOs and everyone sitting around and saying, oh, I don't know, these people in the classroom, they're overpaid. And I think, gosh, there's not a person at this table who's paid less than three or $400,000 a year, and they're complaining about teachers who work three times harder than they do for far less rewards. And they kind of got my goat. <laughs> well, connecting this to our conversation about charter schools, um, my impression, uh, including from reading your book, is that some of our best and brightest young people are going to the charter schools for various reasons, the excitement, the elan, and also because they're not prepared to make a long-term investment in teaching. They want to do it for a few years. Uh, so what are the teachers like in, in the charter schools? Well, from what I've seen of the charters, they are attracting terribly smart young people who are right out of college. The whole charter school model is built on having a steady infusion of young teachers uh, who are willing to work 50, 60, sometimes 70 hours a week, uh, preferably single, no family, so that they don't have to worry about going home and feeding or, or taking care of anyone else. Uh, and it's fundamentally an unsustainable model. You cannot imagine a national school system built on, on there are just not enough people who are 24 and who want to work 60 or 70 hour weeks uh, for a teacher's salary. But that's the, the, the basic charter school model. The thing with charter schools is that there's an assumption that charter schools are somehow the magic bullet that we've all been looking for. They're wonderful because everybody will read an, a, a story in the paper about, gee, there's a charter school in Washington or in this, you know, San Francisco or New York, and look what they're doing. Amazing results, 100% of the kids passing yeah. every test. What they don't tell you is that um, charter schools nationally don't get better results than regular public schools. Nationally, there are 5,000 charter schools. There are some really excellent ones. There are some really awful ones that should be closed down and haven't been. And in the middle are lots of average schools. If you look at the national assessment, which is the federal testing program, the national assess assessment of educational progress, they have now compared charters and regular public schools since 2003. So it's 03, 05, 07, 09. Charter schools students have never outperformed regular public school students. That's true for black students, Hispanic students, low-income students, and students in cities. So the charters have not outperformed. But more significantly, and I think we're, which is what I am concerned about in my book, is the charters tend to accept, tend to attract the most motivated students. So even when they open up in a very poor community, as most of them do, They'll have a lottery where the motivated families will say, I want to get out of the system. I'm going to go to the charter. They have a lottery. And then they, however many students they accept, they end up with fewer students who are limited English proficient, fewer students with disabilities, uh, fewer students who are homeless, fewer students who are immigrants. And they have a more selective population. And, and more teachers who are excited or yes. more short-termers. Yes. But so so they, they have an easier-to-teach population, and then they counsel out and get rid of the low-performing students. I mean, what, what I've seen in study after study was of the kids who were accepted, uh, by the time they complete three years, four years, or five years, 40 to 50 percent of the kids who started are gone, and we're not replaced. So they can say, look at our graduation rate. It's fabulous. Well, sure, if you start off with fewer of the hard-to-educate kids right. and you kick out half of them, you're going to have a better graduation rate. Aren't numbers wonderful? <laughs> you can do anything with them. Before we end, so we've talked about the evils of No Child Left Behind or the difficulties of it, uh, in your view, and charter schools. And we also talked about the uh, unprecedented power that the federal government and the Secretary of Education now have over America's schools. So let me ask you a question, which I know you've been asked before. So if you woke up tomorrow and you were Secretary of Education, well, the first, thing I would, do? the first thing I would do would be to require that every child in America learn to play a musical instrument. <laughs> Why is that? Yeah. I didn't expect that that's, answer. That, that's a kind of a joke answer. I, it, because, A, it would do no harm. 
and B, I think it would do a lot of good. I actually think that the federal government at this point in time is way overstepping the boundaries of federalism. Uh, I, it's one thing to have a reform where you say, we have, we, we have various demonstration projects, we have experiments, we have evidence, we know that this will work, and we're going to mandate, require, or incentivize everyone to do it. Right now, the federal government is saying, well, we don't really have any evidence, but we're going to put out $5 billion and tell you to 48 out of 50 states to change their laws to do something that's un basically unproven. So how would you try to persuade President Obama to change course? I, I'm not sure that I could. I think that he has a mindset. Uh, I know that uh, last fall, uh, Secretary Duncan went out brainstorming with Newt Gingrich and Al Sharpton, uh, selling this idea of they want a mayoral control where there was no basically no school board and the mayor could do whatever he wanted to do. I think this was what the president wants. I, th I think that he wants to have no child left behind as the foundation for what he's doing, and I think it's a mistake. Uh, at this point, I, I'm not sure how to persuade him other than to uh, have people with far more power than me uh, sit down with him and say, you're heading in the wrong direction. Well, I'll stick in my two cents because we're about to end. And that is that um, if more people read your book, uh, The Death and Life of the Great American School System, maybe there'll be a crowd to go talk to the president That as would well. be wonderful. Well, uh, Diane Ravitch, thank you so much for being on Policy Watch, and we hope you'll come back. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.